This morning, Lord willing, if clock willing, we're going to look at three passages in the New Testament that those who would argue that the law, the law of Moses, is still binding upon the Christian, will go to to try to make their point. The first passage I want to look at is in James chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, turn there with me. We're actually going to begin looking in James chapter 1. But the verse that people will look to, or maybe the verse is, that people will look to and say, see, here is a New Testament epistle bringing the Old Covenant law to the Christian. In verse 8 of chapter 2, James says, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. That is a passage that seems to indicate that at least James is using the Old Covenant law and saying, here you Christians are bound by this. So I want to look at this this morning. Back up with me into chapter 1. James is a, is a somewhat difficult book to preach or teach through. Part of the reason is because James, it appears, changes from topic to topic very rapidly, very much like the Old Testament book of Proverbs. He will make statements and then make another statement, and there seems to be no connection at times. It's kind of hard to fit a context together for the entire book. And I think that's by design. I think it is a lot like the Old Testament book of Proverbs. A lot of uh, short, terse statements uh, and instruction. But I do think there are a few pieces of continuity throughout this book. One of the themes, uh, one of the aspects that flows through this book is the idea that faith by itself is worthless. Probably that passage in chapter 2 comes to your mind when you think of the book of James. He starts that idea back in chapter 1. He says in verse 19, This you know, my beloved brethren, but let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Now, this verse precedes a verse that we all know very well. The next verse says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers. When you hear a sermon preached, On that verse, be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. What is the context and the purpose of that sermon most of the time? We need workers. We need nursery help, that kind of thing. You would go to this verse if you're trying to communicate to somebody what? The scripture, right? Don't just listen to the scripture, but do what the scripture tells you to do. Now, that's a good principle, but that's not precisely what he's talking about. Verse 21 Putting aside all filthiness and all the remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. What is the only word that is able to save your souls? The gospel. Or, I heard someone say Christ. That is certainly an acceptable answer as well, because Jesus is the word incarnate. But... He is the word, he is the good news, the message. That is the word. This word is implanted in you. It's able to save your souls. Then the next verse, prove yourselves doers of the gospel. That's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? Prove yourself workers or makers of the word, the message which can save your soul. He's not talking about evangelism here, as we will see. But keep in mind, the word that he has in mind is not simply all of Scripture, but the gospel. The message which you believe, which makes you a Christian. Now, this is sort of like a sandwich. This is one piece of the bread. The other piece of the bread is in 2.14 and following. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? That is a rhetorical question which in the Greek demands the answer, no. A man who simply professes with his mouth, says, 
I believe, but has no works, the faith that he has is unable to save him. And he gives an illustration. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet do not give him what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Think about it. Somebody comes along and they need help, and you say, Oh, I'm going to pray for you. Go, and, and may the Lord bless you. May he provide food, food for you. May he provide clothing for you. Go, my brother, go, go, please go. What use is that? Are you of any value to that person? He needs help, and you do nothing to help him. Those are just empty words. You're saying, I'll pray for you. I pray the Lord's blessing upon you. They're just vacuous verbiage coming out of your mouth. Even so, he says, faith, if it has no works, is dead. And as he says at the end of this section, just like a body without the soul is dead, so a faith without works is dead. Now, that's kind of the point of this, this passage. Don't just hear the gospel. Do the gospel. Do what it is you say you believe. Let's go back to chapter 1 now. Verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Here's what it's like if you only hear the word, but you don't do it. You go and you look at yourself in the mirror. And you're looking and you see your eyes. You see your nose and your mouth. You see the stubble where you need to shave a little more. You miss a spot. You see all the freckles and things. You see your hair. You see that. And you turn right around. And now you have no idea what you look like. Looking into the mirror and seeing your reflection and you turn away, it makes no lasting impression. It has no permanent effect. You have to go back and look in the mirror again. Oh, yeah, that's what I look, that's who I am right there. I haven't a clue what I look like. Who am I? Somebody asked you, you have brown hair? I don't know. You have blue eyes? I don't know. Oh, yeah, I've got brown hair. I've got blue eyes. The mirror tells me that. You have brown hair? I don't know. You have blue eyes? I don't know. I forgot. That's what it's like if you just hear. It's the person who hears someone speaking the gospel, and you say, yeah, I believe that. And then you walk away. Do you believe the gospel? I don't know. What's the gospel? I don't know. That's what he's saying here. Just hearing the word means nothing. But it has to produce works, effects in your life. Verse 25, But one who looks intently at the perfect law the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but a doer of work, this man shall be blessed in what he does. Now notice the context hasn't changed. When he talks about the person looking at the perfect law, the law of liberty, he's not talking about the old covenant law. He's still talking about the word which is implanted, which is able to save your souls. Or else the whole thing falls apart. It doesn't make any sense. So the gospel, he's calling here the perfect law. And he says it's a law of liberty. Now a lot of scholars, especially those in the Reformed Covenant camps, the Presbyterian groups, will come and say this law that he's talking about is the Ten Commandments the Old Covenant Law. In fact, anywhere in the New Testament where it says law, it means the Ten Commandments. Unless, of course, it says you're not under it. Then it doesn't mean the Ten Commandments. I'm serious. Now how, in everything we've been studying, how can anybody possibly refer to the Old Covenant Law as a law of liberty? Paul says in Galatians, we've been through this, it was a slave master. It was the disciplinarian to wrap you on the hands every time you reach for something you shouldn't. It pushed you back, spanked you on your way back to the straight and narrow. It is not, and never was, and never can be a law of liberty. You all need to come from Missouri, like me. 
And when anybody ever says this law, this word law refers to the Ten Commandments, you need to say, show me. (laughs) Prove it. Because you're not going to find that that is the case unless you want to find that that is the case. Where it says looks intently, it's literally to stoop down, to really come down and scrutinize this law of liberty, this perfect law. It's the gospel that he's referring to, the word implanted that is able to save your souls. That person will be blessed in what he does if he's not simply a hearer, but he actually figures out what it is that he believes, and then it produces an effect in his life. Now he goes on and gives an example. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. If you hear the gospel and you think you understand the message, but then you can't control your tongue, that's false religion. You're just a hearer. This is pure and undefiled religion, that you obey the Ten Commandments. Oh, no, sorry. That you visit orphans and widows in their distress and keep yourself unstained by the world. That's true religion in the sight of God. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism or prejudice. For if a man comes to your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? He's now talking about being a doer of the message of Christ, and he's using an example. If a rich man comes in and you give him great blessing and give him your attention and treat him with favoritism, and then a poor man comes in and you treat him like dirt, you're missing the point. And then he throws in sort of an everyday example. By the way, isn't it the rich people that sue you all the time? Isn't it the rich people that are constantly blaspheming God? God chose the poor of this world. You yourselves are examples of this. So why would you want to show favoritism to the rich anyway? But that aside, it's sin, he says. You are not to make distinctions like that among people. A rich man is not any more blessed or any less blessed by God, or at least in no more of God's favor than the poor man. Don't make those kinds of of separations. Verse 8. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing good. Now he's talking about the royal law. Surely now he's talking about the Ten Commandments. The right response is? Show me. Where has he mentioned the Ten Commandments? He hasn't. What does the word royal mean? Of the king. Who's the king? Jesus Christ is the king. If, however, if you people are really keeping the royal law, the law of the king, according to the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, it's in the Old Testament. It's not in the Ten Commandments, by the way. In fact, it's sandwiched in a little bitty kind of obscure place in Leviticus in between don't put a log in front of a blind man who's walking and don't let your two cows breed together if they're of different breeds is love your neighbor as yourself. The king shows up on the scene and somebody asks him, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, how can I differentiate all ten? You can't divide the ten up. No, he doesn't appeal to the Ten Commandments at all. He says, this is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, strength, and mind, heart. And the second one, by the way, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Here the king of all glory has come along and said, these two commandments are the hook on which everything else in the Old Testament hangs. These are the foundational laws. You want to talk about an eternal law of God? It's those two. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbors yourself. This is the royal law. And James here is saying, these rich men come in, these poor men come in, you differentiate between the two. If you're going to keep the law of the king, love your neighbors yourself. Don't make these divisions. Love your neighbors yourself. If you were poor, how would you want to be treated? If you were rich, how would you want to be treated? If you're a rich man and you want to be treated with favoritism, you've got problems. Keep the royal law, he says. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. The Ten Commandments? No, not the Ten Commandments. The law you just spoken of. Love your neighbor as yourself. That law convicts you. You guys haven't got that show me thing now yet, have you? That law convicts you. You're not loving your neighbor as yourself if you're treating the rich man as of higher order than the poor man. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. If you treat this rich man as more important than the poor man, you're breaking the law. Even if in many other areas of your life, you are loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, he's speaking to Jewish people. How do I know that? In his introduction, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. He's speaking to Jews, Jewish converts. He knows they know the Old Covenant law inside out and backwards. He knows that this principle, that being a, a breaker of one law, makes you guilty of the whole thing. So now he brings in an example that they would understand very clearly. Verse 11, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Ten Commandments? Yes. He's just quoted verbatim from them. Show me. I'm showing you. <laughs> so, in this manner, in this way, speak, and in this way, act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, which cannot be the Old Testament law. Because the Old Testament law is never a law of liberty, but only enslavement. Act and speak as those who are going to be judged by the law of liberty, the law of grace and mercy, the gospel, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The reason James goes back and quotes from the Ten Commandments and says if you break one, you break them all, is to show these Jewish people, these Jewish converts, it's not okay to have this area of your life where you're loving your neighbor as yourself, but have this one glaring exception. You're still guilty of not loving your neighbor as yourself. All right, let's go to 1 Timothy. Again, the verse in this section that people will appeal to is verse 8, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. All right, let's back up and get the context. He's writing to his beloved Timothy. Look at verse 3. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus in order that you may instruct certain men not to teach... What does the NIV say next? False doctrine. False doctrine. That's better than the NAS. The NAS says strange doctrines. That misses the point. It's other doctrines, literally. Or teach what they shouldn't be teaching. Teach a false doctrines. Strange doctrines makes you think of you know, strange Greek things or something. That's not his point. His point is, instruct other men not to teach false teaching. He has something very specific in mind. Nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. What do genealogies make you think of? No, uh, okay, Mormons. How about uh, before Mormonism existed? <laughs> Jews. This idea of myths, when Paul writes to Titus, he uses the same thing, but he puts, instead of just myths, he puts Jewish myths in genealogies. 
The strange or the other false doctrines he's worried about, again, is the Judaizing uh, heresies. The Jews. Don't pay attention to the Jews, to their, endless, their myths and their endless genealogies. That's good. Mormons are very concerned with genealogies. Yeah. <laughs> Which give rise to mere speculation rather than the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our commandment is love. If you read Paul's use of law, you're going to see that when he talks about the law that the Christian is to obey, over and over and over again, it comes down to love. In fact, he says on two other occasions, in Romans and Galatians, the entire law of the Old Testament can be reduced to this, love your neighbor as yourself, the royal law. The goal of our commandment, he says, is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and an unhypocritical faith. For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law. Now here it's proper to think in terms of the old covenant law because he's just talked about myths and genealogies. Things which, as we see in Titus, are Jewish things. So there are men in the church at Ephesus who are trying to teach the Jewish genealogies and teach the Jewish law. Remember, Paul spends the better part of chapter 2 and 3 and into 4 dealing with the fact that there's no longer a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. We're all reconciled as one man in Christ. The Judaizers must have been gaining some strength there in Ephesus. And he says, Timothy, I want you to stay there and warn these men not to be teaching this stuff. They want to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make bold assertions. These men don't know what they're talking about. They want to be teachers of the law. They want to start preaching the old covenant to these Gentile Christians in Ephesus, and they don't have a clue what they're getting into. But we know the law is good... If one uses it lawfully. Think about that while we go on to the next verse or two. We know this. The law is not made for a righteous man. But for those who are lawless and rebellious. For the ungodly and sinners. For the unholy and profane. For those who kill their fathers or mothers. For murderers and for immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and lions and liars and perjurers thank you and if there is anything else that lies in opposition to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted first of all know this the kind of people that the law was designed for are unrighteous unholy liars kidnappers murderers immoral Timothy, if there are people like that in the church's Ephesus, you've got problems. Because that kind of stuff doesn't belong in the church. It may be that that was part of their former life, but it better not be part of their present life. Because as James made very clear, as Scripture teaches over and over again, you cannot continue those kinds of lifestyles and be in the kingdom of God. That's who the law was designed for. But go back with me to verse 8. We know the law is good if one uses it lawfully. How do you lawfully use the old covenant law? Well, here's what you have to do if you're going to use the law lawfully. First of all, you have to make sure that they get circumcised. Everywhere the Judaizers went, they were requiring men to be circumcised. We find it in Acts 15, we find it in Galatians, we find it in Romans. Everywhere they went. They were not just after making the Gentiles keep the Ten Commandments. Contrary to popular belief. Show me where that's the case. It always involved circumcision, at least. So if you're going to use the law lawfully, if these men who want to be teachers of the law are going to do this right, do it properly... Make sure they get circumcised. Then lay out the whole kit and caboodle. Not just the Ten Commandments. Lay it all out. And by the way, if you're going to use the law lawfully, can't forget those nasty things in Deuteronomy. 
as Paul told the Galatians, all who are of the law are under a curse with no exceptions. So if these men want to use the law lawfully, they got to bring the whole thing and make sure and tell these people you are in desperate need of a savior because you're under a curse. And, by the way, if you put yourself under the old covenant law, it is a sign that you have rejected the Messiah who has already come to atone for your sins. So as the writer of Hebrews would say, there's no sacrifice left. If you're going to use the law lawfully, you've got to go all the way. You can't pick and choose. And by the way, we know that the law was made for people who are kidnappers and liars and perjurers and murderers of their mothers and fathers and homosexuals. You want to be under the law? Do you need that law? He is not saying we should bring the law upon anybody at this point. He's trying to show the law is good, but you have to use it as it was intended to be used. And what that means is you're a liar, you're a murderer, you're immoral, you're under the curse, and you need a Savior. All right. Romans. Romans. Chapter 7. All right, let's put this in context. Chapter 5, verse 20. The law came in. The law came in. The old covenant law. He's already been talking about it. You want me to show you? Go back to chapter 2 and 3. The law came in that the transgression might increase. We've talked about this already. The reason God gave the law to the people of Israel was not so that they would be more righteous, but so they would be more sinful. I know that seems backwards, but remember the purpose of the law was Messiah. They were supposed to see the strict judgment of the law, realize I can't attain to that. Help, God, help. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And call out for help. Instead they said, no, we can keep this. We're righteous. We're good. The law was given so that sin might increase. Who was it given to? Who was it not given to? Gentiles. Thank you very much. Now he goes on in chapter 6 and he says, so the fact that grace has now come and it's super abounding over uh, sin and condemnation, should we go ahead and sin more? God forbid, may it not be. How can you who are dead to sin still continue to sin? You can't. In the midst of this argument, in verse 14, he says, For sin shall not be master over you. Why? Because you're not under law, but under grace. Not under law. Now here, I kid you not, I'm not trying to be facetious or have a rancorous spirit. I'm not. I want you to see how presuppositions cause people to distort what's clearly there. One of the leading reformed commentators that I used a lot when I was going through Romans, in many ways I think he's, he's wonderful. In chapter 5, he says the law there is clearly the law of Moses. In chapter 7, where we're going, he says the law there is clearly the law of Moses. In 6.14, when it says you are not under law, he says this is clearly not the law of Moses because of the use throughout the book of Romans. I'm not kidding. He is so committed to the fact that the Ten Commandments are binding upon the church that when he gets to this verse which says you are not law, he says it doesn't mean the Ten Commandments here, even though elsewhere it does. And because of the way Paul used the word law, it obviously doesn't mean it here, although in 5 and 7 it does. We have to be careful of our presuppositions. They will distort the truth. The law was given to increase transgressions. He turns and says, you are not going to be enslaved by sin because you're not under the law. Remember in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, the sting of death is sin. And what's the power of sin? The law. Talking to the Jews here, primarily. Now, get to chapter 7, and he tells us exactly who he's referring to. Or do you not know, brethren... For I am speaking to those who know the law. He's talking about Jews here. Are there principles we can learn in the next couple chapters? Absolutely. But the primary audience, remember the two-four distinction? 
The two are the Jews. He tells us that. I'm speaking to those who know the law. The law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. You never get out from the old covenant until you die. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. He's talking to the Jews, and he says, just like a woman, as long as she is married, she has to remain faithful to that one man. But if he dies, the law doesn't apply anymore. So she can, she's free to remarry. You Jews are under the law as long as you're alive. But you died with Messiah. And the law is no longer over you. Why? So that we may bear fruit for God. Again, the context is the Jews. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful of passions which were aroused by the law. The law was given so the transgressions were increased. Here he's saying the law did its job. We sinned more when we heard the law. Talking about the Jews. When they were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death, but now having been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound... So that we serve in newness of the spirit, not in oldness of the letter. As Jews, he's saying, we've died to the law. We don't have to serve the letter of the law anymore. We serve by the Holy Spirit. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Did God do a bad thing by giving us that law? Say it louder. May it never be. May it never be. May it get at all. God forbid. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, taking every opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. See, he's almost personifying sin here. There's this thing in me called sin. And I was all fine, happy as a warm puppy, until the law comes along and says, don't covet. And then this thing within me came alive and said, covet, 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 covet. I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. It was all good until I heard the law. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. Not the same death as in Christ, by the way. And this commandment, which was to result in life, if you do these things, you will live, says the old covenant, proved to be death for me. For sin, again, it's something almost external to him he's talking. Sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So that the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Please don't take away from anything I've ever said in this class that there's something wrong with the law. It's not the law's problem. It's my problem if I'm a Jew. I'm a sinner. Paul says the, the law is holy and just and good. It's sin within me that's the problem. So then, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? No. May it never be. It's not the law's problem. It was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. That through the commandments, sin might become utterly sinful. Now the problem with this is, is because there's a paragraph break here with a different label on top. It's not a separate section. What's the first word in verse 14? For. That is not introducing a new section. It means because. Everything I've been saying, because this. So block out that label. This is all one great big chapter, one great big paragraph. Continue the thought here. For we know the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For that which I am doing, I do not understand. I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the law 
that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? There is a part of me that so desperately wants to be Paul wrestling as a Christian here because this perfectly summarizes my struggle with sin. I know what's right. I want to do what's right all the time. But there seems to be this element in me that is dragging me down. I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I don't want to do. Anybody experience that? But alas, that is not what he's talking about. He's talking as a Jew under the law. As a Jew, he understands, I should keep the law. That's God's law. I can't do it. The law comes along and says, don't covet. And what I find myself doing is coveting over and over and over again. And of course, any Jew is going to say, I shouldn't covet. The law of God says, don't covet. There are curses associated with not keeping the law. Of course he wants to keep the law. He doesn't want to perish, but then he finds he can't. He's a wretched man. Who can save him from this body, this body of sin that continues to drive him into corruption? There's an answer for that question. Thanks be to God through Jesus, Messiah, our Lord. Just an insuppressible doxological statement. Praise be to the Lord. And he gets back to his argument. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Remember the whole context here. He started off saying, I'm talking to you who know the law. A Jew is bound to the law as long as he's alive, just like the woman is bound to the law as long as her husband is alive. You've died to sin. You've died to the law. However, I want you to remember, Jews, that I was alive. I was feeling great until the law came. But it wasn't the law's fault. It was this sin within me. And you see, I have this battle going on. And I want to keep the law because it's the law of God. And there are curses associated with it. And it's the right thing to do. But I can't keep the law. And so what I find is there's this battle. I see on one hand I'm serving the law of God in my mind. I'm a hearer. But with my flesh, I'm serving the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah, Jesus. Do you see why to the Jew... Christ should have been such good news because he's battling the law. He knows he's a sinner if he's thinking at all. And he should have cried out and said, help, wretched man that I am. Messiah has come. They didn't all do that. There is no condemnation. Why? Why is there no condemnation? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Because there's a new law. For those of you who are familiar with Chronicles of Narnia, there's a deeper magic. There's something beyond the law of Moses written on tablets of stone. There's something other than the administration of death, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians. There's the law of the Spirit of life in Messiah. And we have been freed, he says to his fellow Jews. We have been rescued, released from this law of sin and of death. For the law was powerless. It was weak through the flesh. God sent his own son in the likeness of the flesh of sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. That is the verse that people come to and they say, See, Christ came so that we can fulfill the Ten Commandments. Verse 4. Okay, follow the bouncing ball here. Say this with me. You are... One more time. 
You are not under the law. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> Except Christ came and condemned sin in the flesh so that you who are not under the law can fulfill the law. Okay, the requirements of the law. Does that make any sense to anybody? Part of the grammatical linguistic struggle here is this word that is translated in the NAS righteous, or requirements rather. I say righteous requirements. Some, some version says righteous requirements. And NAS says requirement or righteous? Requirement. Requirement. It's a word that can be translated several different ways, and even in this very epistle to the Romans, it's translated in several different ways. It can be used to describe the decree or the ordinance or the law in any form, not necessarily only God's law, or the penalty or punishment. Now, of course, those who want to say that it means that we are obligated to keep the Ten Commandments would say it's the decree or the ordinance. So what he's saying then is, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did in sending his Son in likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that you might keep the Ten Commandments. Now notice, even in the English versions, in verse 4, it's passive. What is doing the fulfilling? Is there any way to make this we? Something is going to be fulfilled in us. By the way, the context is still the Jews. It's not that we are going to fulfill something, but something is going to be fulfilled in the Jews. So even if this means the decree or the ordinance, he's saying that Christ condemns sin in the flesh so that the decree of the law might be fulfilled in the Jew. Not that they're going to go carry out the law. But what I think fits far better is the idea of penalty. He starts off, there is no condemnation. Christ did what the law couldn't do. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the penalty of the law would be fulfilled in us. Exactly the same thing as Paul says that Christ came in Galatians 3, Christ came to take on the curse of the law for the Jews. That makes much more sense to me. Either way, if someone wants to argue that the law here is the Ten Commandments, the proper response is, show me. He has not excluded any of the other laws. If you're going to talk about the law of the Old Covenant here, you have to take the whole thing or else prove why it's just the Ten Commandments. So if what he's teaching here is that Christ condemns it in the flesh so that we might keep the law... It's got to be the whole thing. But the point of the passage, he's just talked about what the law does. Why would somebody who's been rescued from this slave master, somebody who has been freed, where Paul explicitly says, those of you in my women's ministry teaching class, the explicit teaching is that you are not under law. Why would then the apostles say, all of this was done, you've been freed, you've died to the law, you're not under the law, so you can keep the law? Does that make any sense? Where does the New Testament ever teach that the law, including the Ten Commandments, are helpful in your sanctification? The law arouses sin. It was given so you would sin more. So what makes us think now we can keep it? Remember, we cannot just abstract part of the law from its historical location. It is the old covenant made with Israel, and it's over. This was good news for the Jews. The righteous requirement, whether it's the decree or the penalty, it was fulfilled in them in Messiah. Who are they? Those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. As we've already said, those who are born of the Spirit, who walk according to the Spirit, need a different kind of law than the Old Covenant law offered. 
We no longer need a law to arouse sin. We've already come to the place where we know we're sinners. We've received forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Now we need a law that is appropriate for spirit-filled followers of Jesus. 